with the risk factors. Next, yeah. Next, there we go, thank you. Okay, so when we look at risk factors for people who are um, trying to get out of difficult situations, we know that all over the world that there is a, a multitude, there are multitude of reasons why people struggle. One is um, disease, and that is certainly right with us at this time all over the world with the COVID-19. We know that poverty is a huge risk factor. We know that violence and domestic violence is um, uh, horrible all over the country, and I'm not going to go into too much of that right now. And certainly the generational legacy that we see of uh, where the beat goes on, and this is the way we've always done it. And so um, what we want to look at today is what can we do about that? And how do we empower people to do something about that? And when I was doing um, some research for this, um, and I'm going to show you this book, and maybe you can put it up there. Uh, there's a book called From Risk to Resilience, Everything Young Women Know and How to Empower Them to Change Everything. So, Risk and Resilience, From Risk and Resilience, How Empowering Young Women Can Change Everything. And I love this book because she speaks about the human rights crisis and the plight of women all over who've been treated terribly um, simply because they were born female. And she poses a question which I want us to really look at. And that question is, you know, what if we could change the world? What if we could stop talking about it and actually start doing something about it? So that's what got us started. And so what I want to do is rather than show you a whole bunch of gory slides of unspeakable horrors that women have endured for years and years, I want to shift to the hopeless, away from the hopeless, away from the painful and the dark and the downtrodden to looking at resilience and hope and light. And I'm going to do that with and provide proof of this concept with real women who have changed the world despite the odds. Some of these women you will recognize, some you may not. Next, Anna, thank you. Okay, so here's a group of six women. And I'm just going to briefly tell you about them and and some of the hot, hit the highlights about them, all right? So first is the young lady, Malala. I have a typo, I apologize, it's Malala, not Mahala. And she's known only by her first name. No last name is needed for this young woman. And if you're not familiar with her, please do read about her and look her up. She is a powerhouse. So who is she? She's a champion for women's rights in education. She's a young Pakistani girl who, when she was 11, was doing a blog for the BBC. It's pretty remarkable. Most well known, though, is the fact that she defied the Taliban and she demanded education for women. And despite the risk, she spoke out on that. And she got shot by the Taliban for doing so. And yet, she survived. Not only has she survived, we would have to say she has thrived in her young life. And I can't begin to list all of the uh, many awards that she's won, <clears throat> but I will point out one. And that was at age 17, she became the youngest person to ever win the Nobel Prize. So quite a young lady. And the next person is an American, Clara Barton. Some of you may know her. She uh, was a quiet woman with great strength. She was self-educated during the American Civil War. She was known for her humanitarian work and her civil rights work. She was an advocate before women even had the right to vote. 
She was really timid, but she was very persistent. She was a scrapper, as we call them, and she played rough and tumble with her brothers when she was a kiddo. I thought it interesting that while she was young, she, um, sorry, her mother invited, there we go, her mother invited one of the cousins over to the house, and the goal was to help Clara to develop her femininity and overcome her shyness. Well, if you decide you're going to read Clara Barton's um, biography, you will discover that she did a lot more than that. She founded the American Red Cross. Our next person is Marie Curie. She was Polish and also a naturalized French citizen and was a scientist. And the risk she had to overcome in dealing with um, all men in the scientific world <clears throat> were extraordinary. But so were her accomplishments. For example, she was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize. She was the only woman to win it twice. And she was the only woman to win in two different fields both chemistry and physics. Um, Albert Einstein called her the only person who couldn't be corrupted by fame. She dedicated her life to the study of radioactivity and how to treat cancer. And then she literally gave her life as well because she died of aplastic anemia from exposure to radiation. So she was quite the powerhouse and, and an amazing woman. The next lady is Margaret Mead, and some of you all know her as a, an American cultural anthropologist, and she had great interest in the field of helping people. Uh, she was a role model for what women could do at a time when that was difficult. She's known for uh, social learning theory, cultural conditioning, child rearing, and her work in applying theory and principles to solve social problems. One of my very favorite quotes <clears throat> is from her, and it is this, never doubt that a small group of concerned citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that has. Next is a young lady who's made a lot of people mad. Her name is Greta Thunberg, and she is a remarkable girl. She's a Swedish teenager and who is an environmental activist for climate change. The girl's a teenager, mind you. I would uh, say that she has been described as a blunt, straightforward, and demanding. I, on the other hand, might call her feisty and fearless. And she has a major risk factor that a lot of the others don't in this group. And it is listed as a disability. She has Asperger's, she has severe OCD, and she has selective mutism. The descriptions of her as blunt and demanding are related to going in front of the Swedish parliament about the climate crisis. And she created a global movement for the climate crisis along the way. She made the cover of Time Magazine and she made a lot of very arrogant politicians mad on her way to a nomination for the Nobel Peace Prize. <clears throat> the next person in the news quite a bit right now, her name is Kamala Harris and she is a prime example of going from risk to resilience. She had immigrant parents, in two different minority groups. She has a list of accomplishments a mile long, including being the first black woman to be nominated as vice president. And she is not afraid to stand up. And she fits my favorite motto, which is stand up for what's right, even if you're standing alone. Next, Anna. And lastly, Kristen. The Honorable Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a teeny weeny little powerhouse, <laughs> a champion of the downtrodden, a feminist icon 
who won five out of six cases she argued in front of the Supreme Court. And she's a role model for so many. Quiet, brilliant, determined, determined and passionate. <clears throat> who forever changed this country with their fearless battle for the unheard, the unloved, the voiceless, and for people of all genders who have experienced dis discrimination. And she is a perfect example of how to help people go from risk to resilience. And at this very moment, she is the only woman to lie in state in our nationals nation's capital. I love this quote about her and, you know, we should, we should aspire to what she has done in terms of helping people. I'd like to be remembered as someone who used whatever talent she had to do her work to the very best of her ability. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, 1933 to 2020. And now, on to some pretty other remarkable women in this room via Zoom. I am very pleased to uh, give an introduction of our next panelist, but before then, we were asked to give some re resilience tips. I swim laps and I do water ballet. I have a weekly gathering of cool friends, and I have a monthly Zoom session with a professional so support group that I belong to. So now, I'm through, thank you very much, and I want to pass this on to our next presenter, Dr. Judith Lando. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Well, hard act to follow, thank you. That was wonderful, um, inspiring, and um, I like to go on to something that um, takes us a little bit more into the actual dealing with what we're what we're seeing in times of crisis and um, I think if we all aspire to do as much as we can as the wonderful women Kristen shared with us um, and part of that will be understanding what we can do as things change around us. So what I'm here to talk about is changing family patterns in times of crisis. Next. Thank you, Anna. Yep. So as Kristen said, we face growing, growing crises around the world. And I'm um, not going to go into all of them, but I think just to draw attention to the fact that it's not just the <clears throat> COVID-19 pandemic, although that is certainly occupying a great deal of our own attempts to achieve resilience and to help our patients and clients get there and their families. But um, one of the things that happens when there's a major crisis is we tend to forget about all the other things that are happening. And we're still dealing with opiates. We're dealing with crystal meth that is um, absolutely swamping the world at the moment because it's so much cheaper than, than opiates. Um, Crisis always brings forth a lot of the hidden, um, the hidden beliefs, the hidden prejudices, the hidden stigmas. So we're seeing a huge increase in racism, not just in the United States, but everywhere else. Um, global climate change that many people are trying to ignore is certainly making a huge impact on many parts of the world. And I was recently teaching, teaching Alaskans and the northern, the northern cities in Alaska are already almost underwater and losing lots of their land. And the, um, the prediction is that by 2050, there will be 40 million climate refugees. So if we think about waves of refugees that we've seen through the past, the climate change is going to dwarf those other numbers. Um, huge increase in sex trafficking, terrorism, and random acts of violence. And one of the things that I found really, really helpful is that there have been a number of studies done looking at the impact of 
sudden crises versus people who get used to living in a crisis situation. So comparing you know, random terrorism with something like the Israeli-Palestinian situation and finding that people get to accommodate. And I think we're all finding that although COVID has brought dark times, it's also brought, brought out our creativity, finding new ways to connect, finding new ways to build resources. Look at us, here we are on a, an amazing virtual companionship, exploring a topic that's important to all of us. So I think it's heartening that we do adapt. We do better with a chronic crisis than we do with random and sudden things. So when we think about how we're going to help our, our clients and our families, helping them find those ways to adapt and learning why it is that crises impact us the way they do. Next, please, Anna. Um, so traumatic events result in 30% increased rates of stress. And that's not just stress with cardiac arrhythmias, pulmonary disease, but other chronic life-threatening illnesses. We tend to be thinking more about what happens with behavioral health, addiction, mental health issues. But along with those come all the physical, the physical things as well. So I think one of the things that COVID is doing is making us much more aware that we need to be collaborating, that we need to be thinking about co-occurring disorders. Um, suicide's the second leading cause of death for people between 10 and 24. So awareness that when there's a crisis, we see more of all of these. Next. Um, and of course, we see first breaks of mental illness, we see behavioral compulsions increasing and substance use disorder increasing. So again, just um, it's always useful for me to think that regardless of what someone's calling me about, I need to be looking at the whole picture because it's highly likely there are other things happening too. Next, please. So um, one of the things I did was try and understand why, why crises put so much stress on us. And um, one of the things I found was that if, if people go through three or more major life transitions in a short space of time, and it's not just us ourselves, but our close network, our support system, our family and friends. And um, at times where people are living normally, not, not like right now when we're living through, through a pandemic, but normal times, three, three crises, three transitions is about the point where people can cope. So think about, think about your own transitions, you and your, your close support system, and how many transitions are happening right now for you probably a few more than would normally be because of having to adapt to COVID. So um, <clears throat> when we think about transitions, I think sometimes we tend to think it's only the traumatic ones that impact us. But in fact, it's also celebrations, graduations, weddings, births of babies, um, moving, promotions might be really exciting, but they also require adaptation and change. So just think, try and think about the number of transitions that are happening with you and your family at this point. Knowing that three or more are likely to throw people off track and somebody in that closed system might become symptomatic or be struggling with something. Next, please. So this is what happens during or shortly after community crisis the average population runs around six transitions. And it can be, as you can see, 
some people in this particular sample were running at 12, 16, 23, 27. You know, imagine adapting to all of that at once. Now, what's, what's interesting is if you think about the general population, typically during non-stressful times running around three, we as healthcare providers are always about two transitions more. So where they may be at three, we're at five. Where they may be at six, we're at eight. You've been adding up yours. Let's go to the next slide, please, Irma. So what I want you to think about is take one of those transitions that you identified. And I'm going to give you a minute just to add up the number of tasks that that one transition has added to your daily load. So in this particular sample, one additional transition added an average of seven tasks. Now, if you think about seven tasks and seven or eight or nine or 10 transitions, think about the load that that gives everybody during the time of crisis. And um, it took me a long time to work out why it was that transitions throw us off track. But knowing this gives us a concrete way of helping people understand why they're experiencing stress. Um, think about your own somatic reaction to stress. You know, I think again, as healthcare providers, we tend to know what it is that our bodies, how our bodies respond to stress. You know, we probably, most of us know that we get a headache or a sore back or butterflies in the belly or whatever it is. The general population typically doesn't know that. 90% or a little bit over 90% of people who go to primary care with the same problem again and again, thinking that it's a physical illness, are going because of stress and not understanding that this is their particular stress response and that they need to be looking at what's going on in their lives and in their families to be able to fix it. So again, just thinking about the concrete things we can do to help people manage. So why is it that having that many tasks becomes problematic? Next one, please, Anna. In two minutes, Judith. Thank you. Next slide. So what we're looking at is our coping mechanisms are challenged when resources don't balance with stresses. Next slide, please. So we need to be looking at, whoops, where are the other slides? Um, hold on, they're in my presentation. What? We're just going to be, um, no, it's okay. Um, go, go back to the challenge slides. So what we need to do is, um, is look at, look at the, look at the, um, the resources. We want to look at their physical resources, um, their family resources, how many people do they have to help? You know, if they're living with, with or near extended family, they're not going to be quite as stressed. If they're living on their own and now with COVID isolated, they're likely to be more stressed. So how do we start helping them find additional resources, looking at relational resources, physical, finance, food, People living in food deserts alone are going to be much more stressed. So looking at that balance to help them find their way 
to reduce their stress and reduce their likelihood of not coping and developing problems. Um, what we found was that, um, have a guess about how many healthcare providers it takes to, to replace one family member. And think how often we meet people who have a whole team of carers. It takes five of us. So we need to work with people to find members of their natural support system to replace us so that we can go on and help more people. Thank you so much. And um, thank you, Kristen is going to be taking us through Heather's presentation. And I'm sorry that we don't have, there it is. Are these your slides? Yeah. Okay, the one with, yeah. So this is just a very useful map. And um, if you go to our website, um, you'll find papers that give this to you. This was New York the day after 9-11. And this was with a community meeting where the community identified all of their supports and resources on the transitional field map. And we use this also for individuals and families to look at how many people do they have in their family and relational support system, extended support system. And as I said, the more of us in the ancillary or artificial support system, the less we know they have the natural support and that's what we need to be working at. And when we do an assessment, we need to assess across all those levels and find all the wonderful things that they can pull together to reduce their levels of stress and illness and help them deal with crisis. Thank you. My resilience tips. Um, I've, I try really hard to connect to joy and beauty in family, friends, the animals I love, other people and the universe around me, the joy of the birds and the beauty. Um, trying to find it in myself is really hard, but I know, and I know we all find that really hard, which is why we're working in the helping profession, but it's really important because if we don't have the resources, we can't share them. And then I meditate and pray and go to regular peer support meetings. And that's been a joy of COVID, is being able to be in meetings with people all over the world. So thank you very much. And thank you, Kristen, for sharing Heather's information with us. Thank you all. Thank you, Kristen. Um, just one second. If I, I think there's some people needing to get in. So I'm just, have to stop sharing this for one sec to let them in. All for bearing with me, Zoom life. <laughs> that Diane Klein. <laughs> oh. Okay. Back to it. <laughs> okay. Well, obviously, I am not Heather Hayes. Okay. <laughs> But she unfortunately could not be with us today. So we're going to um, pinch hit for her, so to speak. Um, and Meredith and Denise, you had a long conversation with Heather about this. So uh, please jump in um, if, we, uh, if you'd like to, so we can uh, cover, cover Heather's material for her. And I believe that this topic, adaptations we've made since COVID-19 is timely for all of us, and we could spend days and days talking about what that's been like, but obviously we don't have a lot of extra time on that. So I'm going to go through it, um, and I think it's a succinct, clear presentation of what we're really dealing with. Next slide, please, Anna. So what are we dealing with? We're dealing with all kinds of stuff. I don't know about you all, but I've had to totally change my practice. I know Heather has, and we're trying to follow all the guidelines, keep people safe. We're trying to manage our cases and work with our families um, in doing interventions by Zoom. And that is a real trip, as those of you who've done it know, uh, but it actually works. 
Um, so that whole process of intervention to get people to treatment centers and get the family the help they need has been so challenging. Um, I don't know about you all, but I know for Heather um, that, and others of us as well, that we've had, our practices have increased and we've had to figure out what to do with the families because we don't have family workshops for them. And honestly, if we are not dealing with the family, we aren't doing it right. And I think I speak clearly for Heather on that, that the days of just identifying the patient and saying, go off, get better, and we'll be fine when we get home, we all know that really does not work. So questions that you probably have asked yourself and are already doing that Heather is posing here are, you know, what can we do as professionals? And do it, we can also follow our own advice, by the way. <laughs> One is that we can bolster the confidence. Next slide, please. Thank you. We can bolster the confidence of the whole family system, providing new resources, being creative, and again, move the focus off the identified patient and onto the entire family system and healing the entire system. And I think very importantly, we must also um, create um, a safe environment, not just for them, but also for us. And in doing so, we are um, providing safety for all of us and doing what we want to do, which is help families. Next slide, please. What else can we do? You know, we want to increase protective factors. Connection creates protection. So we, that's what we're trying to do in the midst of isolation. We want to motivate people to change still. And we want to provide good, strong support from family and friends for people who are struggling. You know, we're looking at what are the external factors over which we have a lot of zero control. How do we help with employers and their employees under such stressful conditions, job loss, laying people off, closing businesses? And how do we help the families cope with what is the isolation? I've got lots of uh, cases that uh, uh, Heather and I have shared um, where we're just trying to scramble to get people where they need to be. And it's, it's quite challenging and very difficult. We also want to make sure that we have a therapeutic alliance, which has been difficult with doing this by Zoom, but it's doable and we have done it. And lastly, we want to look at interdependence within the system and how we as professionals work together. Many of the people on this call, I've worked with you all, Heather has worked with you all um, to bring about what we want uh, for families and to promote healing. So the last thing I do not see on here uh, are, are Heather's resilience tips, but um, I can tell you a couple of them. And if any, Meredith or Denise, you wanna jump in and give one. One is riding horses, Whoopi in particular. One is hanging out with her husband, Eric, and the kids and um, also creating a situation with lots of laughter. So I'm speaking for her, but not uh, obviously not covering it as she would, but I'm happy to do so and really sorry she can't be with us. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. On to Good job. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I don't know. This is Meredith. Um, thank you, Kristen, for, for pinch hitting. And um, I am going to be talking about women caretakers. I'm really honored to be on this panel of fantastic women that I look up to, I admire, and who are such an important role in my life um, that, I, that I have as my support network. So I'm really honored to share this panel and stage with all of you. Um, women caretakers, and, and that role I can talk about a little bit more, but I think it's important to really understand 
who the woman is and and in order for us to move forward in our lives and where we go as as whatever role that we are going to take on we have to understand who we are next slide so just really quickly this is the definition of a woman a female person associated with a particular place activity or occupation next slide please so who are who are we and just by a show of hands you know you can probably raise your hand and keep them up for each person each role that you may see on there the daughter the sister the wife the mother i won't read all of them but you know what i'm my hand is up for almost all of them <laughs> i'm not sure i'm much of a car mechanic but nonetheless i'm you know and and we we put all these roles on us and and you know some of which are are given to us that we don't have a choice of and some of them um we take on and we take on and we take on next slide please and so going back to that role of a caretaker women are the primary caretakers of children and elders in the in the in every country in the world and and we are especially during times of political organization and of a society of change, we as women are the lead in helping the family system adjust to new realities and challenges. So just take a second and reread that bullet point because now, timely as it is, we, the women, are the ones that are helping and, and adjusting to these changes. I mean, I can talk right now, I think with all, uh, and identify with a lot of you, I've got three little ones upstairs all throughout the house, just, you know, making sure that they got on their Zooms this morning and, and, and are studying. And I had to send a text to the math teacher because my daughter's in tears that she didn't understand the assignment. So, I mean, I think we are understanding that we are, we are t as women taking the lead. And what does that do with us? So next slide, please. Next slide. So again, timely, this was the year that it was 100 years that we celebrated women to get the right to vote. So I think we are, and from what Kristen led us off of the, the women that have paved the way for all of us in which to be able to be the women that we are today, to have the roles that we have. And so because of that, I think it also raises that question of as women and within society, what are those expectations and are they different for males and females? And I think we can absolutely say yes. And what does that come with those expectations, that pressure that puts on women in this environment. And so some of those pressures that we have seen, the mental disorders, the depressions, the anxieties, the self-injury, the substance abuse, all are on a rise, not only within today, but also on top of some of the pandemic and the, the political organizations and such that are just adding to the stress already of those expectations. Next slide, please. And women, you can have it all, right? Isn't that the slogan that we've heard for years and years and years? Do we want it all? The do it all generation of females is feeling the strain far much more than men. And we see that every day in our, in our practices, in our families, in our friends. And so the question remains, are women truly thriving as ever before? And the answer is yes and no. We definitely have doors that have opened up. And again, Kristen laid out of just a handful of women. They, are, they have paved the way and that we will forever be grateful for. But there is a pressure that goes along with it. And, and that, you know, um, that slogan to be a success, we have to do it all. And, and I'm throwing it out there. Do we want it all? And do we play into that? What does that mean? Can we have it all? And what is that meant for our own mental psyche and our mental well-being? So we need to ask ourselves, if we want it all, what does that mean? And within what boundaries? Next slide, please. What is the cost? all those roles that we had our hands up for, 
are they are we seeing the extra pressures of these depression anxiety headaches weight gain i think you know um judith may have touched on that as well as a community and and um what we're seeing in our practices when people come in with these physical ailments these mental ailments what are we dealing what does that mean what are the roles expectations and pressures that they are putting on our families are putting on ourselves society is putting on women what we're putting on our women what we're taking on as women these are the questions that we need to ask ourselves and our patients next slide please having it all often means no strength and no time to care for ourselves and themselves next slide please and so sometimes with having it all sometimes uh can be uh the perfectionism comes into play and i love brene brown and and i thought that it was also timely with this um that we're dealing with of uh, having to do it all right or that because of all the changes we are being asked we're not doing it right and and what does that mean we were you know working as a nation and as a country and even within our own lives you know we had that routine all down pat and then the pandemic happened um or other crises happen and then we can't do it all right that's change so what does perfectionism mean? And Brene Brown, um, you know, kind of sums it up. And, and I had an aha moment when I was, you know, doing my own research around, you know, am I trying to be perfect? And what does perfect mean? Next slide, please. That caretakers, women not taking care of themselves is not because they don't want to but yet are we buying into expectations that uh, society is putting on us? Everyone's expectations are filled first. That's the, depl the depletion loop. We are taking and taking from ourselves without giving anything back. And we are, as women, typically the last on the list of priorities, leaving little, little left for ourselves. And I, and I, um, you know, I'm nodding my head because I, I can fall right into that. And, and I, I feel it in my body when I am taking on too much. Next slide, please. And, and then adding on the COVID. And here are some kind of astonishing statistics around what is going on. Not only did, are we, you know, depleted ourselves but yet now with the pandemic, what are we, are we reporting? What are we feeling? And so I do think it's important that we talk about this with ourselves, with, the, with our patients, with our friends, our families. What is it that we're feeling in our body? What is it that we're feeling emotionally? Next slide, please. And as this topic is about women and resilience, I think it's also important to discuss what resilience is not. It isn't to grin and bear it. It isn't to avoid trauma. And it isn't to resist change. Next slide, please. Self-care is non-negotiable in, in regular times, but even more so in times of crisis. And what does that mean to be better equipped to communicate your needs? And how do we do that? How do we become stronger and healthier? What does health, setting healthy boundaries look like? And how can we get ourselves recharged? These are questions to ask yourselves, to bring to your discussions with your patients. How are we appreciating ourselves? How are we being grateful and patient with ourselves? How are we being a role model? And self-care truly is not about being selfish. And, and I put in the parentheses here, a personal experience. And because I think, you know, um, you know, Judith and her resilience tips said that, you know, finding the joy and beauty in herself is one of the hardest things she does. I also have a very hard time with, you know, feeling that I'm not being selfish and taking time for myself. And so it was because of some of the women on this panel today that encouraged me to do an, you know, a three to four day intensive to really find out and do a deeper look in and dive into my own self care 
And that was one of the life changing experiences that I just got completed with last month. And so I'm so grateful that I took the time for self care. And I'm really hopeful that this can, um, you know, spark some sort of a motivation within you in each of you today. Next slide. Two minutes. Thank you. So the change in our societal attitudes are about learning to say no and enjoying the simple, simple pleasures and changing those expectations, that superwoman fallacy that we can do it all. We can do, we can do it all within boundaries, right? We can have a peaceful life, you know, more isn't always better. And it is about that quality time and communicating and setting healthy boundaries. So I really hope that um, what I'm bringing today is to spark some questions within yourselves and to ask your colleagues and to ask your patients about what does having it all, what does having the, the expectations, the pressures, the perfectionisms all mean for you, not only in a day-to-day -day life, but especially during times of crisis. We need to pull it back. We need to learn how to breathe. Next slide, please. And so that goes right into my resilience tips um, that I came up with, and that is about exercise. The power of movement is um, priceless. Just going for a walk or a run, a yoga. Somebody said um, earlier on the announcements that they were doing some Pilates. I know our Chicago uh, next month's Watt meeting is going to be doing some yoga in a forest preserve. And so people can zoom on and do it and also come and do social distancing. I love to uh, bike. I just got a Peloton and during this you know, COVID time. So I'm excited to learn about that. Breathing, the power of breath work. I cannot say enough about that. And I learned how, I didn't know I needed to learn how to breathe, but during that um, intensive, I learned about how um, to truly breathe. And there are some amazing um, support groups out there that just do breath work. So I encourage you to, to look into those and prior prioritizing ourselves, the power of time, how we can schedule a day or a half day just for yourself and mark it like we were a client or, a, or an appointment that we wouldn't miss, right? So we ourselves are our first own patient. And I, and I encourage you to try some of these and, um, and uh, I wish you a, a very healthy, um, you know, time um, in your lives. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Denise. Meredith, thank you so much. And last but not least, Denise Klein. Oh, I'm so grateful to be here. And I'm really shocked that we're running on time too. So this is awesome. <laughs> because this, it's so much um, rich information. I'm just taking it all in. And I'm so grateful to everyone who attended. And I think it's um, wildly cool that we have people from all over, not just the Malibu area. I think we need to do more of that um, because we need it and we deserve it and it's wonderful. And it just makes me want to connect more um, with my colleagues. I think sometimes that, you know, as we get so busy with everything going on around us and all the little T's and big T's happening in the world, um, you know, it's, it's just, you, you pull, sometimes I personally pull away just to, you know, reflect and to get, you know, take care of myself, but this is um, so much more fulfilling. So I just wanna say I'm so grateful for everything that everyone has done to put this together in these slideshows because um, I'm gonna save them and um, continue to review them. My topic that I wanted to talk about um, was um, actually um, borrowed from the London talk. So as Kristen mentioned, we had a dinner a couple of years ago and little did we know what was coming down the pike. So we were all having a dinner and we said, well, Lee said, why don't you guys come to London and do a panel? And I had never been to Europe and I'm like, heck yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna, I would love to do that. And um, shortly thereafter, we had the Malibu fires and um, we went through all of that. So by time I got to London, I was actually pretty burnt out. <laughs> and, um, but everything happens perfectly, right? Um, I got to be around all these wonderful women. And I think the panel in London went really well. We talked about many of these same issues 
But little did we know as I'm looking back at my slides and I kept them in there intentionally is um, as you move on to my slides, the United States of stress. Okay, so this was one year ago that we were in London and um, the APA found that as many as 63% of Americans are stressed about the future, the nation, money, work, the political climate, violence, crime, and the addiction epidemic, okay? So that was a year ago. I would say now um, it's absolutely 100%. Um, little did we know that after the fires, there would be a pandemic, there would be riots, there would be so much political unrest. And um, yeah, I mean, I think we all have to be truthful and say that, you know, it's, it's, it's scary times, um, society, um, is is taking a hit and so how do we take care of ourselves and i would go so far as to say how do we take radical self-care of ourselves during this time and um basically what i've been doing with our team and that again is what i was asked to speak about is what's going on in treatment how do you take care of yourself how do you take care of your teammates when there's so much coming at us every single day. And the one thing that, um, that we talk a lot about at Milestones is just double and triple up your self-care. Put that oxygen mask on um, for a longer length of time because um, you know these are unprecedented times. And so we have to really engage in radical self-care and, and kindness to ourselves and maybe going back to our four agreement principles, which is just do the best we can. I mean, I just heard what Meredith was saying with her kids and what's going on and, um, you know, getting all their Zooms set up before she does her own Zoom. Um, you just do the best you can every day. And some days are gonna be better than others. And we need to give ourselves um, permission to, to just understand that there's gonna be some rough days. And so I hope you're all doing that. Um, moving to the um, slide on um, stress and the health epidemic of the 21st century, just how stressed are Americans? Enough to produce the documentary One Nation Under Stress, which explores the connection between our stressed out nation and US life expectancy. So I would encourage you all to take a look at that documentary. And when we were in the UK, we did talk about this and I saw them shaking their heads too. And you gotta realize this was before the pandemic and all the riots. And so what was happening in America is, was also happening overseas. And they really resonated with the fact that, um, that we all have a lot going on. Um, careers that demand empathy vigilance and compassion can leave workers drained and traumatized. That was in psychology today. I'm gonna to say that again. Careers that demand empathy, vigilance, and compassion can leave workers drained and traumatized. That's the truth. And so I think it's very important that we take micro steps to prepare for these vast new challenges as we reimagine healthcare, and our need to take care of ourselves, our staff, and um, support our loved ones. So some of the things that we had already been doing last year at the treatment center um, were pro-health solutions. And these are things that, um, again, four agreements, we're doing the best we can. I always feel like, you know, we can do better. Um, it's hard, we're a small mom and pop treatment center. And so creating depth and breadth um, in the company can be a challenge um, because you don't want to hire too quickly. But um, with COVID, we've had to um, hire more staff because we're on site and we want to keep the activities high for our clients. Um, and the one thing that we are doing is we are giving our therapists and our social workers and doctors smaller caseloads um, so that they um, don't have to spread themselves so thin. Um, more vacation time. This, this one has actually been a little bit hard because when somebody goes on vacation in a small, in a small company, you have to have their replacement and, and finding adequate coverage um, 
can sometimes be hard, but we are working really hard on trying to provide more self-care time and vacation for our staff. Um, this is one thing I think we're particularly good at. We, we have something that we call take team therapy at our treatment center. And so we cross train everybody so that if someone does call out sick or God forbid their, their brother gets COVID who doesn't work at Milestones, but they think they might have it. We have people who are cross trained to cover for them so they can go quarantine and um, take care of themselves and their family and we still have adequate coverage. Um, we do a lot of motivational talks. Um, we send out a lot of, um, there's so many great um, YouTube videos on um, self-care and spirituality and um, stress management. And so we send those out weekly for our team and they get to them whenever they get to them. But we do really um, provide a lot of psychoeducation for our staff and for ourselves. Um, working from home whenever possible. Obviously, some people have to be on site, but um, admission workers and even myself, um, it's sometimes less stressful to work from home so I can really focus on, on my duties and, and um, you know, kind of reimagining how we're, how we're doing all of these things. And so we do spend a fair amount of time working out of our backyards with a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. Um, and then um, the staff is there, obviously, with the clients. Um, again, double up, triple up on pro-health activities such as yoga, hikes, meditation, prayer, music, sleep hygiene, nutritional hygiene. All of that is so important. And just being super, super kind to yourself. Because if we're kind to ourselves, we're going to be kind to others. And it's just there's a lot of negativity in the world. And I think people just lose their anchor. And so, you know, tying in some mantras daily, you know, to remind ourselves that we're getting a little crabby or a little stressed out, that kindness really does go a long way. And then um, the last but not least of our pro health solutions at Milestones are four day work weeks uh, for behavioral health care technicians. And, um, that's a work in progress. I would say probably 70% of our staff work anywhere, techs work two to four days, and then I still have a couple that work five, but I do my best not to have them work six days because I want them to be able to take care of themselves, rejuvenate, and be there for their own families, and most importantly for themselves, right? And- um, Two minutes, Denise. Okay. Thank you. And I just, I love the little quote, you got to nourish to flourish. And I keep this on my bathroom mirror, <laughs> Remi reminder, kindness, just to um, keep reminding myself to be nice to myself. Um, and then last but not least, moving to my resilience tips. This is always fun. Um, fortunately, I'm a good sleeper. Um, I sleep eight to nine hours. If, if I don't get my proper rest, um, I do, it, I, my day just does not go as well. So I'm really a huge proponent of making sure that you sleep and even, you know, a 10 minute nap during the day can go a long way too. If you can, if you can fit that in, that's awesome. And then I am addicted to inspirational YouTube videos. <laughs> I love Sadhguru. I love Eckhart Tolle. I love um, Carolyn Miss, um, and there's a new gal um, who I've been following, Lori Ladd. She does a daily YouTube, and what I like about them is they get go from the micro perspective of what we're dealing with in our own little microcosm to the macro perspective, which to me is really helpful because when you're working working eight to ten hours in a rehab setting, it is easy to get caught up in the nuances of the day to day. And when I watch those YouTubes, it takes it to a broader perspective. You know, the wise mind, the observer of what's going on in our world as we deal with these little T's and big T's and the world basically has generalized anxiety disorder <laughs> and people are struggling. So YouTube videos are kind of my, my go-to thing um, in the morning and before I go to bed at night. 
And last but not least, I encourage everybody to just follow their joy triggers, you know, whatever you like doing. I'm a big fan of um, little staycations. California is beautiful. I do not need to get on a plane. You know, I can drive two hours up to Ojai and there's a great bookstore. Um, I went up to Santa Ynez and there's a little mission with the Stations of the Cross outside that I had never, I've lived here for 17 years. I'd never been up there. It's only two hours away and it was fabulous. Um, and then just, of course, you know, hanging out with your besties and doing some Zooms and getting some support that way too. So anyway, follow your joy triggers and um, that's, that's all I have. Have a beautiful day. Thank you, Denise. You're welcome. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you, ladies, so much. Just a lot of amazing information. And if any of you want the slides, I, I, I believe we can send the PowerPoint over to you. Um, that inspired me. I, I have a woman's group on the side and I was like, yeah, the whole time, <laughs> just listening and being like, we are amazing, you know, and we're capable of so much. Um, and anyway, it was just very inspirational. Um, does anyone have any questions for these ladies? I just like thanks for inviting me. This information was invaluable. It was great. Thank you for being here, Anita. And nice to meet oh. you. Thanks, Anita. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Me too. Likewise. I um I have a question. I can go unless mm -hmm. anyone has any. Um, for Meredith, just talking about on your slides, you were talking about um just like the do it all generation mm -hmm. um, for women. When did that start? Um, probably after World War II, right? With that, mm -hmm. um, you know, icon lady. I her name is um, escaping me with the bandana, and you know, Rosie the, the Riveter. Yes, Rosie. Uh, yes. Rosie. So probably that's when it initiated. But I think it's just kind of compiled year after year after year, um, and then there was one of the statistics on one of the slides that I probably just skimmed over is that there is um, such a, the population between 35 and 54 for women where that do it all type of um, slogan really hits the hardest. And I think it is because of women who are dealing that sandwich generation too, that we're feeling that stress. And, um, you know, we're taking care of elderly parents as well as younger kids. And then, you know, again, that depletion loop sets in. And so, yeah, it, it has started probably most identifiable, um, you know, World War II, right after World War II, probably even before then, but maybe didn't really have a label for it. But I think we really could notice that it started then and it has just been kind of progressing and adding on after year after year. You know, there, in the uh, most of y'all aren't old enough to remember this, but uh, back in the 70s, the days of uh, Gloria Steinem and burning your bras and all that, um, there was actually a Virginia Slims cigarette commercial, and it was about women, and it said, I can bring home the bacon, fry it up in a pan. <laughs> Anybody remember yeah. that? Yeah. I'm yeah. Woman. Yes. That was just that awesome. char the, char the Charlie Perfume commercial, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and we, we went through a whole series of, um, from one extreme to the other, where women were supposed to be doing everything. And then there were a whole bunch. I used to have some, um, some of the pictures of um, the, the response to that was, I'm a proud woman who is going to sweep my floors and raise my children, and I don't need to work. And there's an amazing television show, um, is it American Women? Has anybody seen it? It goes through that whole piece about mm -hmm. um, fighting women's rights because we have the right to be home. 
And so we've gone backwards and forwards from one extreme to the other. And I think that what, what I'm really pleased about is watching this new generation, the current generation of teenagers and young adults who are really claiming their space as humans and are not caught up in either of the extremes or the need to fight. I think, you know, if we think about the suffragettes from the beginning of the, really from the 18th century, but particularly the 19th, but it goes all the way back to the 18th century. Um, and then, you know, happened again beginning of the 19th with the First World War and so on. That to see a generation that claims their space as human beings without having to say, I'm a woman, I can do it all, or I'm a woman and I don't want to do it all. Um, it's really thrilling. I, I agree, Judith, too, because I don't, as a woman, I don't want to have to apologize, yeah. right? And so I do, I think that it is, I love seeing where um, the generation now is, is going with, with having the voices that they're having. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, that's a really good question, Anna. I'm glad you asked that because I think um, I've wondered about that over the years too. And, and what I've witnessed is I agree with Meredith and everything everyone has said. And then there's another layer to this too, which is I worked in intensive in-home family therapy. Um, so I was going to people's homes. And what I witnessed was I grew up in a typical nuclear farm family where all the roles were delegated. Three brothers, three sisters. Mom did this. Dad did that. Mom was a buffer for the family. If dad had a bad day, you know, mom would like, kids, go in your room, you know, that sort of thing. And now, and I was a single parent too, is when, when you don't have that nuclear family um, and you're working full time and you're like, mowing the lawn and changing the oil and getting, you know, the kids watching over the homework. I mean, it was like, wow, th this is a lot. So I had both perspectives because I grew up in a nuclear family where everything was pretty evenly distributed. And then to be a single mom and I only, you know, I just have Savannah, but I mean, when people have more kids, you're just stretched um, kind of like silly putty. And I think that with, things falling apart, we're actually falling together in society, is that we do get to reimagine. And as Judah said, we get to be creative and we have to keep that paradigm so that we don't put so much pressure on ourselves anymore mm -hmm. as women. Mm -hmm. It's up to us. We only have control over ourselves. And so we have to start with our own itty bitty shitty committees and figure <laughs> out, you know, what we're telling ourselves every day and, and, and create a new mantra for ourselves of self-care. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Any other one, anybody else want to jump in and have feedback or thoughts about that thought provoking question? Diane, Diane, do you have feedback? Uh, <laughs> you can you hear me? Uh, how are you doing over at La Ventana? How are things? Oh, I think. Oh, we lost her. I think she's driving too. Or Kimberly. She's on mute. Oh, oops. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I've been working from home. Um, and, uh, it's been hard because I have, uh, because I um, am at risk because of a condition wow. I have. Wow. I haven't chosen mm -hmm. type two. I've, I've worked from home, even though my centers are a couple miles down the street this way and a couple miles down the street this way. Um, I've been doing everything on Zoom and I am so grateful that um, the team has, <laughs> my team has been great. And I'm so grateful for the staff. And I'm surprised, I, I do the YouTube videos also, but I've been so surprised how, um, how um, you can do so much um, through Zoom and with your teams. And um, I don't know, I've relied a, a lot on my support groups that used to, we all used to meet in person. I'm grateful for the 12 step programs, all of them. Mm -hmm. and I need to attend meetings worldwide. 
And um, it was really, really hard at first because I'm a very social person. And so not to walk the grounds of my center and see my clients each day has been really hard. But um, I, I got used to this and um, okay, I'm embracing it the best that I can. <laughs> Similar to Denise, like what you've been talking about, similar to supporting my team the best that I can also. Um, but thank you so much for all of this. I got a lot of great ideas. Um, I took so many notes too. Can we have a, a copy of the slides? I thought that there were so many helpful tips in the, in the slides that I can share with them, our teams also. Yes, and I will put my email here. Um, if you can reach out to me, sure. I'm happy to send the, the slideshow out to all of you. Um, yeah, any Anna, yes. can you hear me? Now, I can. oh, so sorry, guys. I'm just having some tech stuff because I'm working on my <laughs> iPhone, which is new for me for the Zoom. Um, uh, oh my God, I love everybody on this call so much. I was just thinking about um, uh, all the work we do and the talk about self-care and the spiritual practice. We all have some form of spiritual practice, some a lot, some a little, some intertwined with the self-care. It's all kind of very similar to me, but I feel like the practice is over for that rainy day. You know, they say save your money for a rainy day and it's a rainy day. <laughs> I feel like everything that um, we've practiced when I feel like, um, you know, I'm falling apart with the political scene and the climate of everything happening. I just say it's time to put it into practice so that I can show up and breathe and be here for others in this time. Because um, I know for me, this is personally, um, I'm kept up ruminating at night about what is happening in the world and uh, I'm finding it very challenging, but I'm, I'm getting to practice all the skills that all of you guys have taught me and my, mm -hmm. you know, other colleagues and my clients and so thank you. Thanks, Diane. That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, Anna, I don't have a question necessarily. I just wanted to say thank you to the women that spoke today. I think it was just a really refreshing and helpful reminder. I don't know if anyone else feels a little guilty sometimes engaging in self-care. I, in, <laughs> Denise, thank you for endorsing napping. Mm -hmm. I, I took a nap yesterday and it was wonderful, but I have to say I did feel a little bit guilty afterwards. So um, this, is just a, <laughs> this is just a helpful reminder that that's okay. And so I just appreciate that. And this was amazing. Thank you so much, you guys. Take another one today. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Thank you, Denise. <laughs> love to yeah, kind of just ditto exactly what Jamie was saying. I love the presentation, how it flowed from just the empowering women of what we can do and just what we can accomplish, but all the way through flowing through that. It's also that like humanness to decide what, where we want to sit and where we want to see our roles go. So it's not that, you know, because Ruth Bader Ginsburg gave up a lot of different things that maybe for us in our alignment and our self-care and where we want to be, isn't that journey or that we're going to take but it is just knowing that like women all can <laughs> which is beautiful but I loved the way the uh, presentation just really flowed because I think it it gave a very empowering speech but it also gave a very um settling of we're great where we are and taking care of what needs to be done so we can show up as our best selves and take that talent wherever it is beautiful I loved it Awesome ladies. That that was great. Snaps, claps. <laughs> what a great morning. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for everything, for putting this together. Thanks, Anna. You are welcome. Um, there was definitely some help and couldn't have done it without all of you amazing women here attending and our speakers. And um, we will hopefully see you next month virtually. Uh, so keep an eye out for that and we will see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye guys. Bye. 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 Bye.